Um, the slides are online, bit.ly slash full stack GraphQL. Uh, I guess an alternative title uh, for this talk might be three ways to build a GraphQL API on Neo4j in 40 minutes, because that's what we're going to do. So this is me. Uh, my name's Will. I work on the developer relations engineering team at Neo4j. Uh, so what that means, I don't work on the core part of Neo4j, the database. Instead, I work on tooling around the database to make it easier for you to build applications with Neo4j. Um, I've done that for, I guess, the last three years. Before that, uh, I worked at uh, a few different startups uh, as a software engineer. A few of them use Neo4j as a customer, so I've seen Neo4j from, from both sides. Um, my contact info's on there. Feel free to, to reach out if you have any questions. So here, here's a rough agenda uh, for what we're going to try to do. We're going to do uh, a little intro to GraphQL. Uh, how, how many people have used GraphQL? Oh, okay, cool. So we'll do a brief intro uh, to GraphQL. Uh, and then we'll look at how we build a GraphQL service. Uh, and then we'll dive into some of the Neo4j GraphQL integrations that we've been working on. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some features we want to add to those integrations, uh, what, what's coming down the pipeline for those, and some resources for getting started. And, and hopefully we have time for some questions at the end. So first of all, intro to GraphQL. So what is GraphQL? Uh, well, GraphQL is an API query language and runtime for building APIs. OK, so we can think of GraphQL as an alternative to REST for building APIs. With GraphQL, we start with a strict GraphQL schema that defines the types, the fields available on each type, and the entry points for our API. A GraphQL query specifies, well, first of all, the entry point. Uh, so which entry point are we hitting? Are we searching for users by ID? Are we searching for all movies with the title of The Matrix? Where are we starting? And then a GraphQL query specifies uh, a, what's called a selection set. Basically, once we've started in our entry point, how do we want to traverse this, this graph? How do we want to traverse our schema? What fields do we want to return? Uh, because unlike REST, where we might hit a uh, endpoint that has a very well-defined response that we're going to receive, with GraphQL, the response matches the fields in our selection set in our query. So we're only going to get back the data that we've requested. So GraphQL was created at Facebook a few years ago, and they created it to solve two very specific problems. One was to reduce the number of network requests sent to render a view. So if you think of newsfeed, where we have a bunch of posts and articles, and we have users associated uh, with those posts, we want to load newsfeed. Uh, maybe we hit the personalized newsfeed news endpoint. Uh, we get a bunch of articles. If we don't have the proper user data cached on our device, we might need then to hit a user endpoint to hydrate each one of those user objects. So we may end up hitting, uh, making several requests to render this one newsfeed view. The second problem that Facebook was trying to solve uh, when they created GraphQL is reducing the amount of data sent over the wire. So uh, we said that we only send back the fields that we've requested in our query. Uh, what that means is that well, first of all, we don't have to go to the data layer to fetch all those fields to resolve them if the client is not going to use them. So that saves us query time, execution time, fetching it from the data layer. Uh, but then that's also less data that we send over the wire. So if we're on a slow wireless network, uh, our payloads are going to be a lot smaller. Um, so these are, these are the reasons that uh, Facebook created GraphQL. They open sourced it uh, a few years ago. And the community has really been building a lot of tooling uh, on top of GraphQL uh, since then. So GraphQL makes this really important observation that your application data is a graph, right? It's called GraphQL for a reason. And regardless of how you store your data on the back end in your database, um, your application data, when you're talking about blog posts, uh, 
uh, users, customers that buy products. Uh, that's a graph, and uh, GraphQL recognizes that and presents your API to you to query uh, as a graph. So let's look at an example. Uh, let's say we have uh, data about movies. So we have the genre of the movie, who directed it, who acted in it, what other movies did they act in, that kind of thing. So we start with a GraphQL schema and that defines our types. So we have movie, genre, actor, director, uh, and we have the fields specified on, on each one of these. We'll talk a bit more about the, the format for this uh, in a minute. If we spin up our GraphQL API, we uh, can see our documentation for it. So this is a screenshot from GraphQL Playground, which is sort of a IDE, I guess, for, uh, for working with GraphQL APIs. You can see that we have queries and mutations on the left there. So these are the entry points for our GraphQL service. And then on the right, we have information about uh, our, our types and the fields that are available. So if we send a GraphQL query, here's an example, it looks like this. Note that we're specifying, oops, we're specifying uh, an entry point, so in this case, movie. Uh, we're passing in uh, the title of the movie we're searching for, River Runs Through It, my favorite movie. And uh, then we have a selection set following that. And this selection set is saying, uh, okay, once you've found a river runs through it, these are the fields we want you to grab off a river runs through it, off that node, and then uh, we want you to find the actors. So traverse this application data graph to find the actors, grab their name. What else are we ask asking for? Genres, okay, traverse out uh, to genres in the graph. Uh, and now find directors, so who directed a river runs through it, grab their name. Uh, and then also, so here we're nesting within director, so we're saying, okay, so whoever directed A River Runs Through It, what other movies did they direct? Give me the first three that you find and the title of those movies. So you can see how we're, we're sort of expressing how we want to traverse this graph. Uh, and our GraphQL implementation is going to contain the logic for how to fetch that from the data layer. Uh, in this case, we're fetching it from, from Neo4j, so we're doing an actual graph traversal. Um, but that's not, not always necessarily the case. So when our data comes back, uh, we can see that the format matches our GraphQL query. We get back just the data that we asked for. So okay. Does that mean that we don't need Cypher, that, that GraphQL is the hottest new graph database query language? Uh, well, no, that's, th that's not what GraphQL is. Uh, so it's important to understand that GraphQL is an API query language, not a database query language. So it has limited expressivity, we, right? We can't do projections, we can't do aggregations, we can't express variable length paths like we can in Cypher. Um, it's really just a query language for querying an API. And GraphQL is, is really data layer agnostic. Uh, it's not tied to any specific database uh, or data layer. And in fact, that's one of the great uh, benefits of GraphQL is that we can wrap existing APIs. Uh, we can have one GraphQL service call out to multiple data layers. Um, so that's, that's really flexible. So this, this, I think, is a, is a key point to understand. Uh, and it's also worth noting that if we want to build a GraphQL API, we're not just limited to working on new projects. We can also wrap existing REST APIs. Uh, we can combine multiple data sources into one GraphQL service. Uh, and we can also do what's essentially the microservices of GraphQL, which is called schema stitching, where we take lots of different GraphQL services and stitch them together into one unified uh, schema. So there are, there are a lot of options there. Uh, and then for new projects, there are lots of really great tools. Um, we'll call these GraphQL engines, roughly, basically that, uh, that help us spin up a GraphQL API, either on top of an existing uh, database or 
uh, something that are, is sort of the equivalent of an ORM to help us quickly build uh, GraphQL projects. There's an important concept uh, when working with GraphQL called GraphQL first development or schema first development. Um, and th this again I think is, is an important uh, aspect to understand that the schema, your GraphQL schema becomes your specification for the API and you can actually use the schema to mock an API because you know the, the types and, and the types of all your fields. And this is actually something uh, that's done very frequently where actually the front-end developers will say, this is my ideal schema. Uh, front-end developers will write it, give it to the back-end folks. They can mock the schema so then you can build out the front-end and the back-end uh, at the same time. So let's look at an example. Um, this, is, uh, this is a project that we built uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Neo4j community forum. How many people are members on the Neo4j community forums. It's fairly new, it's only been around for a couple of weeks. So um, definitely check it out if you haven't. Um, so if, you, if you've seen this, actually we can, let's go check it out. So if we go to community.neo4j.com, uh, this, uh, this is a discourse forum, um, but we've added this sort of personalized content uh, at the top here, and we have these community activity feeds where we're showing uh, popular community content, popular community projects, and, and new certified developers. So these are sort of activity feeds showing interesting blog posts in the community, uh, interesting open source projects. Uh, NeoViz.js, which is one of mine, is, is number one on there, so that's fun. Um, and this is all populated uh, from a GraphQL API. So actually what, what happens when this page loads uh, is it uses jQuery to send a GraphQL uh, query to, uh, to some endpoint that gives us back the data to load this view. So let's talk about how we, how we built that GraphQL API to serve this community content. Um, and actually, let's go ahead and query it. So this is available, it's an, it's an open GraphQL endpoint. It is communityapi.neoforjlabs.com. Uh, and this is GraphQL Playground, so this is uh, a tool that I mentioned earlier for exploring GraphQL APIs. Let's zoom in a bit. And so the first thing I can do is explore my schema, and I can see I have four, these are fields on a query type, so a, a query is a specific kind of type that specifies uh, the entry points that I can hit. So I have top community open source projects, top community blogs and content, uh, and then I can inspect uh, the type that those uh, resolve to. So let's go ahead and, and write a query here. So I want to see top community blogs and content. Um, let's get some more space here. And we'll say just give me the first uh, three. So that's my entry point, and now I need to specify a selection set. Uh, well, let's give me the title and URL. So this is giving me three blog posts, uh, one about valid certificates for Neo4j with Let's Encrypt, uh, one about recommendations. Uh, okay, uh, but I can also look at the author. And for the author, I can get a name, screen name, and now when I execute that query, uh, well, okay, I can see it was David Allen that wrote this post about uh, valid certificates. I can see who wrote the other posts as well. Okay, so that's how we, that's how we query a, a GraphQL endpoint. Um, I, I wrote a blog post uh, about this. This has the details in the code, um, but we'll step through it a little bit. So first of all, where is this data coming from? Uh, well, we're ultimately we're querying a Near4j instance. Uh, we call it the community graph. Uh, so the, the developer relations team, mostly my, my colleague Mark, uh, has built out uh, tooling to monitor um, sites like GitHub, Stack Overflow, Twitter, and Meetup for uh, people that are posting Near4j related projects to GitHub, people that are writing blogs about Near4j. We load them into the community graph, uh, and if anyone has seen the This Week in Neo4j newsletter, Twin4j, has anyone subscribed to that? Um, basically, most of the content for that comes from uh, a few queries that we run against Community Graph. Uh, 
So, uh, okay, so we have the data in the E4J. We start with a GraphQL schema. We start with our type definitions. We define a community blog and a discourse user, the fields on each of those. We define on our query type the entry points for our API. So we want to be able to search for community blogs and content. And that is going to give us an array of community blog objects. So um, now this is some JavaScript. So that GraphQL schema uh, that we defined is really just a string. Uh, so it's SDL, schema definition language. So there's a, a specific language that's used to define these GraphQL schemas. And, and the reason for this language to exist is because it is language agnostic. So we can, uh, we can define this schema, we can use this in, in JavaScript, uh, Java, Python, any of the, the GraphQL implementations can work with this. We're going to be using uh, JavaScript here. Uh, and then the next thing we need to do is define our resolvers. So resol resolvers are the functions that contain the logic for fetching data from our data layer. Uh, and in JavaScript, this is um, an object with a bunch of functions. And inside our resolver, we might want to check an authorization header to make sure uh, the user has permissions for this resource. We might want to send a query to a database, format the results, uh, and so on. In our case, we're gonna execute a Cypher query. Uh, this is the Cypher query that we run. Um, it's basically looking for users in Community Graph that have posted some content, and then it uses an exponential time decay function to, to rank them, something that, that uh, Hacker News and Reddit use, so that interesting things that people are upvoting surface to the top, and boring stuff that nobody cares about that's old just floats away. Pretty easy to do in Cypher. Um, and then our resolver, okay, we're gonna execute that Cypher query. When it comes back, we're gonna format it a little bit, stick on a base URL so that we can display it on the website uh, and, and so on. Okay, so how do, we, how do we actually serve this GraphQL endpoint? Uh, well, Apollo Server, um, Apollo is a company that's really becoming the GraphQL company. They're building lots of tooling uh, both on the server and the client for, for working with GraphQL. Uh, and in this case, we're using the Apollo Server Library, which basically wraps uh, GraphQL.js, which is the JavaScript implementation of GraphQL, and Express, if anyone's used uh, Express, it's a common web server for Node. Um, so we use this make executable schema uh, function from Apollo Server, we pass in our, our type definitions, which is our schema, and our resolvers, that gives us an executable schema, uh, we instantiate a, a Neo4j driver instance, and we pass these things to Apollo server, uh, and that's gonna spin up an express server that's gonna serve our GraphQL endpoint. Okay, so that's, that's uh, sort of the, what I'll call the standard uh, way to build GraphQL APIs. We implement some resolvers, and we write some database queries inside the resolvers. Th there are a few problems with this approach, though. One, schema duplication, so I have to maintain a database schema, I have to maintain a GraphQL schema, uh, I have some, some mapping and translation layer because I have a graph on the front end with GraphQL. Uh, maybe I'm not storing my data uh, as a graph, so I have some mapping and translation layer to work there. There's a lot of boilerplate code. You saw what we had to work with, with executing our, our query. We had to implement all these resolvers. Uh, and then uh, performance-wise, we have uh, what's called an N plus one query problem. So we didn't see it here because we're resolving uh, our query with just a single cipher query, but imagine uh, that we had to fetch uh, all of these blog posts, and then for each blog post, we had to go back to the database and say, database, please tell me uh, the user of this blog post. Um, this is the n plus one query problem where we make a bunch of uh, queries to the database. So um, about a year ago, I guess, uh, on the DevRel team, we said, hey, why don't we build a, a Neo4j GraphQL integration? Uh, I think. GraphQL, graph databases in Neo4j, this, this makes sense uh, for a lot of reasons, um, and I think we can solve some of these problems. So these were the goals uh, that we set out for our Neo4j GraphQL integration. Uh, one, we wanna support GraphQL first development, that's important. We want the GraphQL schema to drive the database model. Uh, then we want to generate Cypher from GraphQL. So you send a GraphQL request, uh, we don't want you to have to 
specify the cipher query that maps to that in your resolver. We just want to generate that from some arbitrary uh, GraphQL request. And uh, more importantly, we want this to be a single cipher query. So for any arbitrary GraphQL request, we want just one round trip to Neo4j. Uh, and then boilerplate is no fun, um, so let's not have developers have to implement resolvers. That, that doesn't look like fun. Uh, and then we want to extend the power of GraphQL with Cypher. So Cypher is, is this amazing, expressive graph database query language, um, and we can do this maybe by adding what's called a schema directive to GraphQL. So directives are sort of GraphQL's built-in extensibility mechanism. Um, so let's throw a, a at Cypher directive in there. Um, okay, so GraphQL first development, right? So this, we infer the Neo4j database model from the GraphQL schema. Well, that's pretty easy to do because it's a graph. Then we generate Cypher from GraphQL. Um, and this, this actually ends up being pretty easy because we know what the database model is gonna be by uh, inferring that from the schema. So we can apply some rules for generating uh, Cypher from any arbitrary GraphQL request. Uh, and then extending GraphQL with Cypher. So we've added support for these Cypher schema directives so we can annotate any field either on a query type or uh, any field on anywhere in the type definition with a Cypher query. Uh, and what that does is that basically makes that field a computed field, so we run that Cypher query as a subquery, uh, and the results are then mapped to that field in your schema. And th this is really powerful. Uh, we'll see an example of that in a second. Uh, so there's two versions of our Neo4j GraphQL integration. One is a GraphQL database plugin, this is uh, JVM, it's written in Kotlin, so it's uh, for the JVM, it's deployed to Neo4j, and with this, Neo4j serves your GraphQL endpoint directly. Uh, there also exposes some GraphQL procedures, so you can run GraphQL in Cypher that generates Cypher. Uh, and then we also have Neo4j GraphQL JS. Uh, so this is a, a JavaScript library that is intended to work with any of the JavaScript GraphQL implementations like GraphQL JS, Apollo Server, uh, and so on. So let's take a look at the GraphQL database plugin. Um, so excuse my, my graphics here, this is the, the basic idea, is this plugin is deployed to Neo4j, Neo4j serves a GraphQL endpoint, your clients then talk directly to Neo4j uh, by sending GraphQL requests. It's available in Neo4j des desktop. Um, you can just click the install button and you're good to go. Um, so let's look at generating a GraphQL API from an existing Neo4j database. So I have the Yelp public data set loaded in Neo4j, so this is businesses, reviews, uh, stuff like that. And we'll switch over to Neo4j desktop. Uh, start Neo4j. The right database, yes, reviews, I called it. Um, and so I've already installed the GraphQL plugin. Um, we can verify that just by, by seeing down here the plugins that we have available. We'll go to Neo4j browser. Let's just run a DB schema, make sure we have the right data set. Yep, so we have uh, reviews of businesses, businesses are in a category, users wrote a review. So we have this data in Neo4j, we want to spin up a GraphQL API, uh, how do we do that? Call GraphQL.idl, so this is a procedure that, that ex is exposed by the plugin, uh, IDL or um, Interface Definition Language, another name for SDL. So we have two options here, we can pass a GraphQL schema uh, to this plugin and the plugin will then spin up a GraphQL API on top of Neo4j using that GraphQL schema, or if we don't pass anything, it'll just infer the schema from our database, which is what we want to do. Uh, okay, so now uh, if we go to, so this is, uh, this is GraphQL Playground. Again, I'm just running it locally. Let's hit that with a refresh. Uh, now if we check out our schema, we can see, okay, we have queries, we have mutations, so we can query 
uh, for businesses, by any of the any of the properties on those nodes. Uh, we can query for categories and so on. So let's make sure this works. Let's uh, query for users named Will. I'm sure there's a bunch, so let's just take the first one. Uh, let's get his name, uh, and then let's see the reviews that he wrote. What do we want? Text, stars, um, and then let's traverse out to the business. I don't know what city is it in, and what's its name. Okay, so we run that. Um, behind the scenes, this is generating uh, the Cypher query, something like match on user where name equals Will, limit one. Um, so here's some guy named Will in Talmaj who reviewed the Man Cave Salon. Uh, he gave it five stars, cool, must be a good place. Okay, so that's, um, that's the plugin. I'm gonna leave it at that and move on to near for GeographicQL JS. which is the next version of our GraphQL integration. Uh, this is available on NPM, NPM install near for j GraphQL JS. Uh, here's what the architecture looks like in my, my lovely diagram here. So instead of your client hitting near for j directly, well, you're running um, an express server or something like that that's serving your GraphQL endpoint, uh, and that, uh, that express server is what's actually hitting Near4j with your generated Cypher queries. It's using uh, our fancy Bolt drivers, uh, taking advantage uh, of that for fetching data from Near4j. So we can do like load balancing on our, uh, on our GraphQL servers. We can do caching if we want to. Um, we don't always wanna hit the database directly. Okay, so here's our third way of building a GraphQL API uh, with Near4j GraphQL JS. Um, so let's switch back and switch databases here. So near for j desktop, I'm gonna stop the reviews database and switch to the graph connect schedule graph. So every year uh, my colleague Rick imports the graph connect agenda into near for j so that you can query it uh, in near for j. Uh, so that's always fun. Let's take a look at this database, style reset. Here's a pro tip, if you ever have gray nodes, you can do a style reset, maybe, no, fake news. One more time, there we go. So colon style reset um, will basically rerun the, the styling uh, for your nodes if you ever run into that. Okay, cool, so we have, um, Speakers that speak at a session, so we're in a session now, uh, that takes place in a venue, uh, whatever room this is in, uh, has a tag, the session is probably tagged GraphQL, something like that. Uh, okay, so what we want to do is put a GraphQL API uh, on top of this using near for j GraphQL JS. How are we gonna do that? Well, uh, we define a GraphQL schema so here's what the schema looks like. Um, there are a couple of additions here. So the previous schemas we saw um, when we were looking at movies and actors, uh, we just said, okay, well, this field actors points to uh, an array of actors. One thing we need to do th th is basically give near j GraphQL a hint uh, of the relationship type and the direction when we're talking about referencing another type in our schema. Uh, so that's where this at relation directive comes in. So when we're talking about a, a speaker that's connected to a company, uh, we use this at relation directive to annotate the schema and say the relationship type we wanna use is called works for and it's going out from the speaker to the company. Um, so we add that uh, and then we also have added a sessions by substring uh, query field that's annotated with a cipher statement so that we can search for not just exact matches, because the generated API that we're gonna get is just gonna allow us to search for exact matches, but we wanna do uh, a cipher contains. Um, so we have that query in there. Otherwise, it's a fairly standard GraphQL schema. So what are we doing here? Um, well, think back to what we did uh, two examples ago. 
So our first example, we're working with the, uh, the discourse data. Um, we imported make executable schema from Apollo server. Here we're grabbing make augmented schema from Neo4j GraphQL JS, and we're passing in uh, our type definition, so just that string. Um, and what are we getting from that? Well, we're getting an executable schema object, uh, and we can just pass that directly to Apollo server. Note that we, we didn't define any resolvers. All we defined was that GraphQL schema. Previously, we had all that boilerplate code that said, please give me uh, a connection to the database and send this query, uh, and then format the results in such and such manner. We then have to do that for every, uh, for every type. Uh, so one thing that's nice about near GraphQL JS is those are generated for us. So that's this idea of, of reducing boilerplate. Let's, um, let's run this and see if this works. Make this a bit bigger. NPM run start. Hopefully I'm in the right project. Let's see what happens. Okay, GraphQL API, localhost 4000. Let's check that out. And okay, we've got a query in here. So let's search for uh, speakers named Will Lyon. Let's grab their name. Then let's traverse out to the company, grab the company name. Uh, and let's see also all of the sessions that this speaker has at Graph Connect. Uh, so we run this and yep, we can see we have a speaker named Will Lyon, works for Neo4j. Uh, and he has four sessions at Graph Connect. Wow, sounds like a lot. Cool, okay, so that works. Um, if we jump back to our IDE here, uh, we can see in debug mode the Cypher query that's generated in the background here. So this is the, the Cypher query that's generated from our GraphQL request. All right, it's doing a match on speaker, uh, looking up name, uh, and then it does this um, object comprehension uh, to return the results. Cool. Okay, so that works. Um, Got maybe five minutes left, so let me talk about, uh, first of all, the, the documentation for this is uh, on the GrandStack site. We'll talk about GrandStack in a minute. Um, but again, I just wanna point out this uh, augment schema uh, functionality. It, it doesn't seem like much, like okay, we're getting what, like a CRUD API generated for us. Um, that doesn't, maybe not super impressive, but it's really, really convenient, right? So I can spin up a GraphQL API just from uh, my type definitions. If I want something beyond just basic CRUD, I can do these at Cypher schema directives that gives me the power of Cypher in GraphQL without writing any other code, really. Um, but then the nice thing about Neo4j GraphQL JS is that I can then override any of those resolvers uh, with any sort of custom logic that I want. So if I wanna fetch data from another database, um, if I want to implement my own sort of auth checking, um, I can do all that. Uh, and then if I still wanna generate the Cypher queries, I can do that or, or call somewhere else. So it's really flexible. Um, it, it also generates, again, all of the, the uh, CRUD mutations uh, as well. So, Neo4j GraphQL is part of what we call the grand stack. So this is GraphQL, React, Apollo, and Neo4j database. This is sort of a prescriptive set of tools for building modern applications. Uh, we talked about GraphQL. React is a, a very popular JavaScript library for building UIs. Uh, we talked about Apollo. Uh, Apollo has GraphQL tooling both on, on the client and the server that really makes working with GraphQL easier. Uh, and then we all know Neo4j database. So these, this is the grand stack. Um, th this is sort of how it all fits together. Uh, I, I, think we, I think we can get the idea of, of how that works. There's a GrandStack starter project um, that gives you a lot of the, um, the boilerplate examples uh, abstracted away using Neo4j GraphQL JS. Um, I, I was gonna talk a little bit about uh, how the client works. Um, so let me go through this quickly. So we've, we've talked about how we can spin up GraphQL APIs. We saw how to query them uh, using GraphQL Playground. Um, that's, I guess, would be sort of the equivalent of querying something in, in Neo4j browser. 
Um, but this is the full stack talk, so we want to know how we build applications uh, with GraphQL. Well, once we have a GraphQL endpoint, um, we can query it um, using lots of different tools so that community uh, Neo4j forum example that I mentioned first of all, that's just using a, a jQuery request. So to make a GraphQL request, we, we didn't really talk about this. Um, there's, there's no transport layer specified as part of the GraphQL specification, but the convention is HTTP, uh, an HTTP post request, which um, yes, we do a post for read operations. Um, so you can do it with jQuery, uh, but you can also use tools like Apollo Client. Apollo Client has integrations uh, with most of the very popular front-end frameworks. Uh, here we're using the React integration. Um, so that gives you a lot of really cool uh, functionality. So here we are pulling in the React Apollo integration and we're instantiating an Apollo client instance, basically just pointing it to this GraphQL API endpoint. Uh, and then this gives us the ability to inject the client into our React component hierarchy. Any React developers in the house? A few? Okay, cool. So hopefully this makes sense. Uh, and then this gives us a query component uh, that we can use to actually execute our GraphQL query. So here's that um, speaker query. So look for a speaker by name. Who do they work for? What sessions do they have? And then we also have uh, some handlers for when that data comes back. Here, we're just mapping over the results to render um, a table that, that's showing Will's Graph Connect schedule. And um, the code for that is, is online. This is kind of similar to the, actually it is a fork of the Grand Stack Starter Project, so this is sort of what the starter project gives you. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about what we're planning for updates to these integrations uh, to give you an idea. So currently, one of the things that a lot of folks have asked for are GraphQL to Cypher generation libraries in other languages. We have JavaScript. We have uh, the JVM plugin, um, but the logic for just generating Cypher queries is tightly coupled in the plugin. Um, so the next thing we wanna do is extract out that logic to be able to give you a Java library um, that you can use similar to Neo4j GraphQL JS. Um, so I'd be curious, uh, other languages that people want, if you're building a GraphQL service uh, with Neo4j, what language are you doing it in? Um, please let me know, or maybe shout it out now. I heard, I heard Ruby, I heard Python, I heard Elixir. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and then in, in Neo4j GraphQL JS, um, things we wanna work on, uh, we wanna work on basically an authorization layer that allows you to specify at the GraphQL schema uh, layer, the, basically the scopes that a user should have to have uh, authorization for that field, and then we only generate uh, the Cypher query to fetch those if the user has that scope. Um, we wanna be able to support subscriptions, which is basically PubSub for GraphQL. Uh, I think we can do that using Neo4j's transaction event handler, uh, and then things like nested mutations where we can actually just pass uh, a subgraph to a GraphQL endpoint and say, create this. So those are some things, some things we wanna work on. Uh, if you have ideas for other cool features, um, please let me know and, and we can uh, look into those. So uh, grandstack.io has docs, tutorials. There's a Grandstack starter project that I mentioned. Um, we're doing a Grandstack uh, training tomorrow, if anyone's coming for training. Uh, and then on Saturday, we're doing uh, a hackathon. Uh, I'll be doing a workshop there, and then we have most of Saturday to hack on cool uh, projects using Neo4j integrations. The theme is Neo4j buzzword bingo, um, so hopefully you can make that. And I think I am uh, out of time, but thanks everyone. <laughs>